family at Southeastern, I want to say, uh, bring you greetings all the way from Houston, Texas. Uh, we are so glad to be here in 70 degree weather, and not uh, 100 degree weather. So my wife and I are very pleased to be here. I'd like to rush and say to Dr. Aiken in his absence that the host families that have hosted my wife and I, the Humphreys, the Whitfields, and the Hams, have shown us the sweet spirit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we have been loved, and the hospitality has been amazing here. So we want to thank God for the privilege and the honor of being here with you this day. Um, also, I'm so thankful that this is September the 23rd, which is my wife's birthday. And so my wife is here and with me, Dr. Renique Wilson. I asked my wife, I said, baby, do you want to go to Hawaii? She said, no, I want to go to Southeastern. I said, you want to go to Tahiti? She said, no, I want to go to Southeastern. And so I said, well, I'll bring you to Southeastern on a day like this. So we praise God for her being with me. My wife is Dr. Ronique Wilson, and uh, she has an earned doctorate degree from the University of Houston. She graduated from there in 2006, and I told her in 2006, I said, I like that. I'll call you doctor. I'll call you doctor since you got your doctorate degree. I was graduating in May of 2007 from Dallas Seminary with my master's degree. I said, you call me master? I'll call you doctor, and we'll be all good, amen. So I praise God for her, and I'm thankful for her in 19 years of marriage. Today, I'd like to turn to our attention and focus our attention in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. If you'd attach your attention there, John 8, verse 1 through 11, this pericope adultery. Many of you and I know that this scripture historically may not been in the original writings, may not even been true to the gospel writer John, but I believe that there is some truth that we can magnify the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from in John 8, 1 through 11. So today, if you don't mind, we're going to do something called Bible calisthenics. That means you're going to use your fingers and you're going to flip in your Bible and we're going to look at some truth of Scripture in John 8, verse 1 through 11 and see how this set of Scripture glorifies the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his plan for grace, his plan for mercy, and that great gospel that you and I proclaim and have the privilege to proclaim every single day. In John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11, the Bible reads, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. But when they had persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who was without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. He was left alone with the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us in a powerful and a penetrating way through the person of the Holy Spirit. Peter writes to us and tells us that men preach the gospel by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you and you alone would open up our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in your law. Open up our minds that we might understand the scriptures. May our hearts burn within us as the Holy Spirit speaks to us along the road. We pray most of all, God, that we would be doers of your word and not simply hearers who delude themselves. For it is in the doing of the word of God that we are blessed. We pray that you strengthen us by grace and grant us the ability to teach, hear, understand, and apply the word of God to our lives. That you might receive glory from the lives that we live. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen and thank God. John chapter 8 verse 1 through 11. I'd like to put a tag on this text. I'd call this text case dismissed, case dismissed. When I was living in Houston, Texas, having moved from Austin, the traveling in the highways was done at a little higher rate of speed. When you're driving in Austin, Texas, 
It's a wonderful place. You can look over at the person driving next to you and say, do you mind if I get in right there? And they'll say, oh, yeah, come on in. And they'll wave and let you come on in. But in Houston, the very first time I was working there in the summer of 1991, with my internship with Procter & Gamble, I tried to change lanes and got ran off the road the very first time. So I realized I have to adjust my speed. I've got to drive a little bit faster while living in Houston. So I began to drive faster and faster and faster and faster. And I went home to Austin and scared my mom half to death. She said, what's wrong with you, boy? I said, Mom, I'm in Houston. I've got to drive fast. But finally, somebody caught me, called the police, driving fast. And the police caught me driving fast, not one time. They caught me driving fast two times. They didn't catch me two times, they caught me driving fast three times. And this was before the sanctification process was really working on me, but I was driving fast. And so I had about three tickets that I had to deal with. And a good friend of mine said, Blake, I know how you can get that case dismissed. I'd like to tell you about that. I said, how in the world can I get a case dismissed to where I'm clearly guilty? It's clearly that the police officer saw me and I've got a ticket right here. He said, I can tell you a secret way to get that case dismissed. So when we look at John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11 today, I want to talk to you about how you and I have the privilege to tell someone, just like my friend did, how to get their case dismissed. In John chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and he began to teach them. Now, the main attraction to those interested in Jesus' ministry were not just his miracles, but also his message. Jesus' instruction was powerful. Jesus' instruction, when he broke the word of God and spoke from the word of God, would draw people to him. Matter of fact, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29, the people observed when he was speaking there on the mountain that Jesus did not teach as the regular scribes, but this man taught with power and authority right after the Sermon on the Mount. But if you speed up to Mark chapter 1, Jesus goes into a synagogue. And while preaching in the synagogue, once again, the people say, this man teaches with authority and with power. He does not teach as the scribes do. There was something about the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ that when Jesus Christ opened up the Word of God and would begin to expound from the Word of God and share principles from the Word of God, people were amazed. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says that thousands upon thousands of people were stepping on one another just to hear Jesus Christ teach the Word of God. Well, if you move to Luke chapter 15, verse 1, the Bible tells us that not only were there tax collectors and sinners coming to hear him, but there were Pharisees and scribes grumbling and complaining because sinners and tax collectors were being drawn to the powerful message of this rabbi, Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ was preaching in such a way that people were being drawn to the power of his message. But then in Luke chapter 21, verse 37 and 38, it says, early in the morning, people got up and they went to hear Jesus Christ preach the word of God. Right here in the text, the Bible says that he woke up early and was teaching the word of God. And many people were coming to listen to him. People readjusted their schedules to hear Jesus Christ, the rabbi teach. When Jesus Christ handled the word of God, people readjusted what was going on. And I would like to say to you and I, as we are seminary students and those that have graduated from seminary, that when we open up the word of God, we want the same power of God to work through us, that people come and are drawn, not by antics, but by the teaching of the word of God, the people would come and hear and say, this is the word of God. So Jesus Christ, in the midst of his instruction, is interrupted by some interrogation. Look at the text. In the midst of his instruction, you find in verse 3 through 6, the Bible says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, you need to underline that right there. Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. It is amazing to me that in the midst of Jesus' instruction, there was an interruption. And this interruption was not uh, to really designed to expose this woman's sin where she had been caught in the act of adultery at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles uh, where they were living in uh, 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 sol uh, solitary houses and, and, and they're living in houses on the outskirts of Jerusalem uh, at that time to celebrate what God had done for them during their time where they would travel through the wilderness and how God had been there for them. They were living in temporary housing and so in this environment they 
they caught this woman in the act of adultery. Now, you and I know in the text that it does not mention the man at all, but we know that in order to have committed the act of adultery, and this Greek word here means that she was a married woman, he was a married man, and so they caught this woman in the act of adultery. They bring the woman forward, and it's not really to be concerned with her case, but the text says that they might accuse Jesus that their goal was to accuse Jesus. They were finding grounds for wanting to test Jesus, to accuse Jesus. Why? Because the scribes and Pharisees were losing their popularity. If the people are saying in Matthew 7 that, uh, that Jesus teaches authority and with power, not like the scribes, if in Mark 1 they're saying he's teaching with authority, not as the scribes, then there's being a comparison when they handle the Word of God and when he handles the Word of God. When he handles the Word of God, grace falls forward. When he handles the Word of God, truth falls forward. When they handle the Word of God, legalism falls forward. And so here it is in John chapter 8 that they're coming to gather to hear Jesus Christ, but they want to interrupt him and interrogate him. Notice this, they want to question Jesus to Christ and they're bringing accusations to destroy his reputation. Why? Because his reputation was that he had been a friend of sinners and tax collectors. So if Jesus authorizes the stoning of this woman, he has now no longer has the reputation of being friend of sinners and tax collectors. Well, according to Jewish law, if he says don't stone the woman, he's broken the Jewish law according to Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10. Deuteronomy 22 verse 22. But now notice this, if he authorizes her stoning, then he breaks the Roman law because of the jurisdiction that they're in, that the Jews are not allowed to have to execute capital punishment according to John 18 31, where they even say when they want to kill Jesus, oh we can't kill him, we're not allowed to do something like that. So we want to kill Jesus on trumped up charges, but we want to kill Jesus right, but we want you Jesus to authorize the killing and the stoning of this woman the wrong way. So Jesus is so-called caught in a catch-22. Isn't it amazing when the creature wants to capture the creator? The creature wanted to capture the creator, but let me let you know this. You will never, ever capture the creator when you are the created. No one of us are that smart to trump God. And so watch the text now because there's something interesting that I want you to see. Look at Genesis chapter, I mean, uh, John chapter 8. It says in verse 4, they said to him, teacher. Now that's where everything got messed up. That's where everything is messed up because they don't recognize who Jesus is. Now notice that the scribes and the Pharisees start off with this word and they call him teacher. Do you mind rewinding and pressing play with me in John chapter 1 real quick? Go in your Bible to John chapter 1 verse 29. Let me show you why is there a problem when they call him teacher. Well in John 1 verse 29, John the Baptist says this, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now we get down to verse 35. When we get down to verse 35, it says again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples and he said to Jesus as he walked, behold the Lamb of God. Now this is interesting because John the Baptist just said on one day, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Believe in him. And his disciples didn't. So it was the next day, he says again, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And on that day, they believed him. In other words, just because you've been to evangelism class, just because you're going to go and I am going, does not mean that the very first time that you preach Jesus to somebody, that they're going to receive Jesus. So you've got to keep on preaching Jesus and keep on telling people about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And on this second day, they go. Now watch what happens on this second day. So he says, behold, the Lamb of God, verse 36. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and he said to them, what do you seek? Now, are you reading your Bible? They said to him, Lamb of God. Does your Bible read that way? No, your Bible reads rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? Don't you find that interesting that they start out by believing that he is the Lamb of God, the Savior of their souls, and now that, they call, now that they've recognized him and trusted him as Savior of souls, they now call him teacher or rabbi. Why? Because you need the Lamb of God to save your soul before he can be the renewer of your mind. And so here it is, is you can't start at step two with Jesus if you haven't covered off step one. If you don't believe me yet, walk with me to John chapter three. Go to John three. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. No one can do these signs that you do. Now watch the text, unless God is with him. Now notice this, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born again on oath and he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Why in the world does Jesus Christ start talking about salvation to Nicodemus, the teacher and ruler of the Jews? Because Nicodemus has called him rabbi first. In other words, he says, if you don't mind me saying it this way, homeboy, you can't call me rabbi until you've accepted me as Lamb of God. So he starts a conversation with Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ starts a conversation with him about salvation because we can't get into your sanctification. We can't get into your growth and what I can teach you because the natural man does not understand the things of God. You are still a natural man, Nicodemus. You may hold this position among the Jews, but you're not saved yet. So Jesus enters into a conversation with Nicodemus about salvation. If you don't mind, flip back with me to John chapter 8. And so as we look here in the text in John 8, they call him teacher because they do not recognize him for who he truly is. They have yet to recognize him as their savior, and they begin to question and interrogate him concerning the law. Now notice this, verse 4, they've caught the woman in the act of adultery, in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They want to question Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees, in what they are the masters of. See, the scribes are what I call the Xerox copying machines of the New Testament. They were the ones that rewrote the law. They were the ones that uh, taught the law. The Pharisees interpreted the law and enforced the law. These individuals, they're trying to catch him. They're trying to catch Jesus in the area of the law. They want to say, Jesus, we want to take you back to what we've mastered. We've mastered the law. And so what do you say? And notice what happens. They were testing him, having, seeking for grounds to accuse him. That's very interesting because as they are seeking grounds to accuse him, the Bible says in Revelation 12, 10, written by John the Revelator, who's also John, this gospel writer, that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Here they are trying to accuse Jesus, and the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of their brethren. Now, watch the relationship because later on in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. If you're accusing the son, trying to get him in sin, you're really the one in sin. I need to let you know who your father is. Now watch what happens. And the Bible says something very interesting. They were having grounds to accuse him, but Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. Oftentimes, the Bible does not talk about Jesus Christ stooping down. Well, since these masters of the law want to question the Lord of the law, let us walk back to Exodus chapter 19. I'd like to show you something. I want to show you the illustration lesson that Jesus Christ was trying to teach these individuals if they would have really known who he was. Are you with me in Exodus chapter 19? Turn with me in your Bible right there to verse 10. Exodus 19 verse 10. The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will, look at the word, come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Walk down with me, if you don't mind, to verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was in all smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. And smoke ascended like, uh, uh, and, and ascended like smoke over the furnace. The whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. God answered him with thunder. Now watch the text, verse 20. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now notice that the text says that the Lord descended. The Lord came down. What does John 8 say as he's talking to these masters of the law? And Jesus stooped down. What Jesus is trying to show these guys is you may not know who you're talking to. You think that you're the teacher of the law? You think you're the interpreter of the law? I am the God who wrote the law. If you don't mind, walk with me to Exodus 31 verse 18 because the text says not only did he sit, stoop down, but the Bible says he wrote with his finger. In Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, notice what the Bible says. When he had finished speaking with Moses upon Mount Sinai after giving him the commandments, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Did you see that in your text? In other words, you called me teacher, but you didn't realize you were dealing with God. See, that the revelation of this text is you're not just dealing with someone that you can question, someone that you can accuse, but you're dealing with someone that you need to submit to. 
You're dealing with someone that you need to bow down to, but you don't recognize who I am. And so the Bible says he wrote with his finger on the ground. It's not a matter of what he wrote. It's a matter of who was writing. That's the big deal. Now notice this, if you walk back with me to John chapter 8. So the text says he stooped down in John 8 verse 6 and he wrote with his finger on the ground. But they persisted because they're bringing accusations against him. And he straightened up. He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw the stone at her. All of a sudden, these guys got Baptists. And in particular, African-American Baptists. This may not be a practice here among many of you at Southeastern, but if you're ever in an African-American church and you need to get up and use the restroom, you do this thing where you put your hand up like this and you kind of walk out. That's acknowledging that, excuse me, I'm walking out right now. In other words, when, the, when these people heard Jesus say, let he who's without sin cast the first stone, all of them began to walk away, and the text says, beginning with the older ones. How in the world can you accuse somebody of sin or stone somebody for sin which you have also committed? So Jesus turns the table and says, since you wanted to question me, let me question you. Let me tell you what to do. All of them begin to scatter because this sin has been prevalent in their lives. They cannot stone this woman, so they all walk away. So Jesus begins to humiliate them because they don't want to acknowledge him for who he is. He is the savior of their souls. He is the savior who has offered himself on the cross. Later on in the book of Acts, chapter 15, around verse 5 and 6, the Bible is going to say, and the Pharisees who had believed. It's amazing that here the Pharisees don't believe him, but after his resurrection, some of the Pharisees do believe him, including our guy Saul, who's named Paul. God has one people one day accusing, but later days down the road, he's going to save them and bring them to faith. Notice this. But when they persisted in verse 7 and asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he was without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And the Bible says something interesting one more time, verse 8. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, in Exodus 31, verse 18, the Bible says that the law had been written by the finger of God. But do you know what happens in Exodus 32? In Exodus 32, there's a wild party going on. It's not the type of party that happens at Southeastern. It's the type of party that happens at the secular schools like I graduated from. There's a wild party going on involving little drinking, little immorality. They got that stuff going on at the party. And Moses is there dealing with God on the mountain and God says, Moses, get out of the way. I'm gonna come down and destroy the people. And Moses turns and says, no, no, God. Do not destroy the people, for they will say that you got us out here and were unable to deliver us. Moses intercedes for people caught in the act of sexual immorality, caught in the act of under the influence of alcohol. Moses intercedes, but these men who are thinking that they're handling the law of Moses properly don't intercede. They're trying to accuse for stoning of the woman. And they realize that the charge of murder is even greater than the charge of adultery, and they begin to walk off one by one. Moses intercedes for them in Exodus 32. But when Moses gets down and sees what's going on, he says, this part is not too godly. And Moses throws down those two tablets of stone and they break. And all of a sudden, God has to write the law all over again. Do you mind turning back with me to Exodus 34? Exodus chapter 34, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two, tablets of, two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words which were on the former tablets which you scattered. So be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. Now, he says, present yourself there on the top of the mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took the two stone tablets in his hand. Now watch the text, verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Now keep your finger in Exodus 34 and flip back to John 8. When you flip back to John 8, the Bible says in verse 8, again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Did you see it now? 
that God had to come down twice to write the law of Moses. He had to come down twice and write the law of Moses. So the text shows you that Jesus Christ stoops down twice in this story and writes on the ground. Now here's the amazing thing. In John 5, 39, Jesus told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you find eternal life, but these are they that testify about me. In other words, that if you're really looking in the scriptures properly, you ought to see Jesus. If you're really looking in the scriptures well, somewhere Christ ought to be revealed. And what Jesus was doing was showing them an illustration of who he was, but the very law that they were so-called masters of, they could not see the Lord. And so as they all walk away, we find ourselves in John 8, verse 10 and 11. It says, straightening up. Remember, he stood after the law was written. He said, woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. Here's Jesus' declaration. He says, woman, does anybody, where are those that condemn you? I don't see any of them, Lord. Well, neither do I condemn you. Why? John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John 1. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And so here it is, is that Jesus Christ turns to this woman who's caught in the act of adultery and tells her, Grace, go away. Truth, sin no more. In other words, case dismissed, exonerated. I've explored all the evidence. You've been exonerated. Now, here it is that Jesus Christ tells this woman, caught in the act of adultery, go away and sin no more. If you were in high school and your mom and dad found you in this situation, I doubt that's what they would say. But the amazing thing is, is if you flip back with me just one more time, just oblige me one more time to Exodus 34. In Exodus 34, right after the Lord comes down and descends, verse 6 says this, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands. Watch the text. Who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Go away and sin no more. Do you see it? You search the scriptures, for in them you think you find eternal life. They are they which testify about me. Jesus Christ is showing them what took place during that time of the law. And even in the time of the original law being written, the very first action seen by the people was an action of immorality. But Moses interceded. You don't have the spirit of Moses, nor do you have the spirit of God. What God does is God says, case dismissed. Because we're now living in the time where God is saying, case dismissed. Well, my good friend Waylon Walsh, he told me, Blake, I can take care of that ticket that you got. I said, well, what do I have to do? He said, Blake, he said, all you have to do is appear before the judge. He said, take your ticket that you have for speeding because you've been going to defensive driving class. You've been paying for your ticket. He said, on your own, you've been paying for your ticket. You've been going to defensive driving class. But I can get you a place to where you can go and get off for free. He said, if you go to the judge, and I don't know if they do this in North Carolina, but they do this in Texas. If you go and peer before the judge with your speeding ticket, he said, you can go before the judge, and if the police officer doesn't show up, the judge will say, the case of Blake Wilson, speeding, and he's going to ask, is there someone here that can accuse Blake? And if the police officer's not there, he looks at my ticket and says, Blake, you were doing 68 in the 55, but because there's no one here that can accuse you, I, the judge, will tell you case dismissed. I don't think that you got that. In other words, although I was guilty, if I appear before the judge, the judge can tell me case dismissed. Now, I said, Waylon, I can't believe that, Waylon. You know, I'm from Austin. You're from Houston. Y'all are a little bit more gangster than me. You know, we're in Austin. We make the laws, the state capital, we make the laws that everybody else abides by. He said, no, no, no. If you come before the judge, Blake, I've done it five times. You only got three tickets. I've done it five times. Every time I go, Blake, I go before the judge and I put my ticket down and I'm standing there with great confidence because I'm standing before the judge and there's no one over there that can accuse me because the police officer is not there. And he says, and so all of a sudden, he said, Blake, every single 
single time, I don't end up having to go to defensive driving. I don't have to do something to get myself out. He said, guess what, Blake? I don't have to pay for it and get myself out. He said, I just go before the judge, and the judge says, case dismissed. The greatest news that you and I have to tell somebody is that people that have been caught in the very acts of sin, people that have been held captive by sin, that you and I have the privilege, like Jesus, to turn around and say to them, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, case dismissed. And I hope and pray that some of you will keep on your mind that the greatest message that you and I have is not to catch good people, but to catch bad people, catch messed up people, just like you and I were, and go and say, we know a Jesus. And if you appear before the judge and believe in him and what his ability can do, God will say in your case, case dismissed. Let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, each of us may not have been caught in this case as this woman was, but we have been caught. For the Bible tells us in, the, in James that if we're guilty of one law, breaking of the law, we're guilty of them all. Father God, we were caught but we praise God that you placed the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world in our place on a cross, on a hill in Calvary. And he died in our place, but he didn't just die, he was buried. And he was raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures, as Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And as a result of sharing that message, we can tell other people, case dismissed. Father God, we have the privilege to share the gospel. This is a great commission seminary where they tell the people, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that you have commanded. And lo, you would be with us even until the end of the world. Lord, I pray that you would infuse in these students, Father God, these professors, through the great commission, the power to go and proclaim, not just look at a sick, sinning society, but say, let me let you see a sweet savior who can heal you of all your sin and can wash you white as snow. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the privilege to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ in this place. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen and thank God.